feared in life. But perhaps there is none as terrifying to Americans as these three letters. I-R-S. Hello and welcome. I'm Mark Lucas. The intent of this documentary is to share with you the sight of the IRS and the income tax that millions of people have learned about in the recent years. Business owners all over the country are plagued with the fear that they may have to go through an expensive and time-consuming audit or that a mistake may show up and they could lose thousands of dollars or even be put out of business. The information disclosed on this tape shall provide documentation and means to dispel the myths that planted that fear in the minds of business owners and the working people in general. Most businesses rely on CPAs, tax attorneys, and other tax professionals to handle their payroll and do the day-to-day -day accounting. That was certainly what I did when I had my own business. However, one day I had the privilege of hearing a very qualified public accountant speak on the subject of withholding and what I heard him and others say and the evidence that I witnessed changed my life. I closed my business and for 11 months I worked at putting that information together into this documentary so you can hear and see for yourself. I trained as an accountant, I trained as a CPA back in the 60s. I had a, a thriving tax practice after the CPA field. I processed thousands if not millions of paychecks for people dutifully deducting taxes from them. Um, had a good time destroying other people's lives, I found out. The words of the Secretary of the Treasury published as required uh, everything that applies to it. And in that words, it says that if, in effect, and I'm paraphrasing now, if you are an American citizen and you work for an American company and you live in the United States, your remuneration is not taxable. I was very impressed with Mr. Boss's accounting knowledge, and he was also the owner of a large firm. And this conference was held at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. I thought, if anyone should know about taxation, he should. I'm not revealing anything new. There's people in this room who studied this and discovered it 10 to 15 years ago. I mean, I, I haven't went back to everybody that has been involved in it, but it, I'm not talking about anything new. I discovered it on the net. Uh, I was reading an article that talked about how an employee could do this, how the employee could refute the employer. And I sat upright in bed one night, my gosh, if the employee can refute the employer, why can't the employer simply do it right in the first place? The next guest speaker at the conference was a prominent business owner, and what he had to say floored me as he put something in front of me I never before thought possible. I was struggling with these concepts. Gross income, source of income, items of income, and so on. I've talked to several CPAs, attorneys. I did research on the internet. I read law books. I made copies of the laws from the law books. Uh, the research off the internet, I made copies of that, provided it for the employees. I put this information in the break room. And for three months, they were indoctrinated with the law. So on January 4th, I believe, which was the first work day of, of the year, we did stop withholding from 45 employees. Many other wonderful guests spoke at the conference, but... Although Mr. Bob Schultz, the organizer of the event, had invited speakers from the IRS, Congress, and even the White House, nobody had the courage to show up and face the public and the media with some kind of explanation. Furthermore, I thought that media would have special breaking news stories about how Americans can keep their income tax money, and all those wonderful news would make front page in every newspaper in the country. When that did not happen, the first big question mark was planted in my mind. Then, on Fox TV, Channel 4 News, I saw an interview with an IRS spokesman, and when he said the words code and taxpayer, 
there's no provision in the code that allows people not to pay or withhold with income tax. And taxpayer has never won on that case. When he said the code and taxpayer, I knew I had my second and third question to start an investigation. Question one, why didn't media and the press break the news about the income tax non-liability to the American people? Surely, keeping that third of the money they've been handing over every month would mean substantially more than the generous $600 per head that Congress took months to approve. And media did cover that very thoroughly, mind you. Question two, can the IRS code allow or not allow people to do anything? And if it does have that power, since I'm supposed to know the law, can I be held accountable for not understanding the 7,000-page IRS publication? And question three, does taxpayer mean any American? After being ridiculed by a couple of accountants and uh, almost kicked out uh, of an attorney's office, I decided to interview some people that had experience with court cases on issues of taxation. And here's what they had to say. When you look at the amount of money that you're contributing to the system, doesn't it make sense that you go back and look at the book? The term taxable income means gross income minus the deductions allowed by this chapter other than the standard deduction. So, to have taxable income, we have to have gross income. And then we go to the term gross income, and it defines items uh, of gross income that may be taxable. But it never says throughout the entire, the entire subtitle who's actually liable for this tax. It says this tax is imposed on the taxable income. It doesn't say it's imposed on the individual. It doesn't say it's imposed on the married individual. It doesn't say it's opposed, imposed on the American citizen. It says it's imposed on the taxable income. So who's liable to pay this tax? Well, when all is said and done, you find that subtitle A just goes in this circular loop, this incestuous loop, if you will, of definitions, cross-definitions, and never really defines who is liable until you get to liability to withhold. The only liability is in Section 1461. 1461 refers to the withholding agent, which is in uh, 26 U.S.C. 7701A16, which defines the withholding agent under 1441, 1442, and 1443. 1441 is the withholding agent uh, for withholding tax on non-resident aliens. Uh, 1442 is withholding tax on foreign corporations, and 1443 is foreign tax exempt organizations. So what that means is the majority of, uh, in fact, almost all employers really are not withholding agents as are defined in the Internal Revenue Code. If you talk to anybody in the IRS, they can't make the distinction between subtitle A and subtitle C. In fact, one of the things I recommend if you ever get called in to an audit or if you uh, demand an administrative hearing, an appeals hearing, uh, one of the things you should get on the record is you should ask the, the, the uh, IRS representative there what tax it is they're trying to assess or levy. And, of course, they'll say, well, the income tax. And they say, well, yes, but the income tax is the entirety of uh, Title 26, or are you talking about Subtitle A? Within that, there are specific taxes. This is an, you should ask them, is this an estate tax under Subtitle B? Is this an, uh, a, a, an employment tax under subtitle C? Or is this an income tax under subtitle A? And chances are they won't even know what you're talking about, but at least you're kind of breaking down the code form because most agents don't even realize that these are different subtitles. They'll take a section from subtitle A and apply it to a section in subtitle F and add a section from subtitle E and throw in something from subtitle B and say that you're liable for this stuff and that they're not even the same body of law. Obviously, a state and gift taxes is a completely different uh, uh, tax than employment taxes or income taxes and so forth. So that's a good way to get on the record that the IRS itself doesn't even know what they're talking about most of the time. I must say I can't blame you if you find that hard to believe, but here's what an ex-IRS agent had to say. That's not something that's, that's clear in most people's minds, most agents' minds. There's so much presumption that you owe a tax. You're, you are a taxpayer. There's a presumption that everybody's a taxpayer. If you had income, then you obviously owe tax. If you owe tax, you have to file and declare that tax so it can get assessed. And uh, that's a huge presumption to make. 
So how does one distinguish between presumption and law? The way the federal government makes laws applicable to the citizens of the state is they have to publish it in the Federal Register. So when you want to see a definition, the first place you need to go to is the Federal Register. From there, they'll take it from the Federal Register and they'll put it in, for example, 26 CFR, which is the Code of Federal Register, the Code of Federal Law Regulations applicable to income taxes. I have to cut in here for just a second because the 60 Minutes show featured a Georgetown University law professor, supposedly expert on taxation, denying adamantly the specific use of the word include includes when used in conjunction with the word employee for the purpose of tax laws. For those of you who watch that show, this should come as a nice little treat. Well, my dear professor, to use your expression, hogwash this. Let's go to the Federal Register, September the 7th, 1943, and this comes from Section 404-104, page 12267, Employee. And I'm giving you an exact quote here. The term employee specifically includes officers and employees, whether elected or appointed, of the United States, a state, a territory, or a political subdivision thereof, or of the District of Columbia, or of any agency or instrumentality of any more, of any one or more of the foregoing. Is that you? No, it's not me. And it's probably it's applicable to the Congress, it's applicable to the Senate, it's applicable to... We're talking about what? It specifically includes elected and appointed officials of the government. Now the government can't come back with its bogus arguments of, well, includes is expansive. When include is expansive, it can only be expanded to other meanings within the term defined. For example, if the government says, we are going to impose a tax on liquor, including rum, whiskey, and um, gin. Can they include Coca-Cola in there? It's like one of the IQ tests that we used to take in school where they give us a series of words and we'd have to say, well, which word doesn't fit in there? Well, Coca-Cola doesn't fit in there. It is not within the meaning of the term defined. So even though it could be expansive and uh, include another type of vodka, you can include vodka in there. That's within the meaning of the term defined. But you can include Coca-Cola. If you go through the code and look at the use of the word includes, you'll find that Congress, through the excellent work of the Congressional Research Service, has done a beautiful job of being absolutely consistent in the use of this word. So, what does this mean to the employer as far as withholding from his employees' wages? Well, what it, what it essentially means is that you're not required to withhold unless your employee is an officer of some public entity or an officer of a corporation. Most people who are employers will withhold from the employee from their employees wages um, a social security tax which we all know is uh, what seven and three quarters almost eight percent now and um, that social security tax is a tax on the employer measured by wages now the wages of the employee are not really taxable unless the employee gives you permission this is done through the what's commonly referred to as the w-4 form and if you look at the w-4 form it says on its face Withholding Allowance Certificate. This is where the employee allows the employer to withhold and is certifying that allowance by signing his signature to that document. It's important to note that the Social Security tax levied on the employer, measured by the employee's wages, which we commonly refer to as the employer's contribution to the, to the, to the Social Security, that tax is has been held by the Supreme Court in the case of U.S. versus Silk, which I believe is a 46 case, uh, to be a legitimate excise. And while that may be arguable and we may want to change the law there, uh, I would not recommend to any employer that they forego paying that tax unless they are operating without a tax ID number, unless they uh, have not executed a SS4 form wherein they essentially state that they are a withholding agent because even if the tax is properly levied, there is no requirement at law that the employer become an agent of the federal government and a tax collector. The federal government, what, what the proper way to uh, avoid that would be to let the Treasury know that 
they're perfectly willing to post one of their officers at your place of business and collect this tax if they like. Or, in the alternative, uh, you can uh, uh, make a determination as to what the cost is to your business to collect this tax for them and ask them how they want to pay you for that. Chances are they will uh, ignore your request, in which case uh, there's no obligation at law for you to become an agent of the federal government. You are not a tax collector. And unless they're willing to pay you for it, they can't take your property without just compensation. This is also part of the Bill of Rights. Um, there's lots of other uh, deficiencies in the way the tax code is enforced that when all taken together, there's just, uh, it, 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 it makes it untenable that we have the situation we have today. But in any case, what happens normally is then the employee executes the W-4. If the employee doesn't execute a W-4, most employers will contact the IRS, and the IRS will say, well, then you have to withhold at the rate of, of uh, you know, one exemption. And this simply is not the case. There is no authority to withhold. How does one find out about the authority of an agency like the IRS or even the federal government? Here's what a 30-year veteran attorney that majored in government had to say. The way that you find that is by, of course, going to the, to the Constitution and, and examining the power of Congress to make laws with respect to income. You're not going to find any power over private income. The Congress has no power to impose an income tax, say, on a dentist in Grand Rapids. Even a dentist who employs a receptionist and a dental hygienist and a um, janitor, because there's just no federal connection. There's no authority there. If I look to see where does it say that the revenue officer position exists and where's my authority for doing the things that I did, it's not there. Well then, if there's no authority, how does the IRS do it? If Americans knew in a, on a large scale that if they don't file a 1040 and that the IRS does it for them and then tries to collect the tax, if they knew that IRS can't lawfully do that, uh, there'd be a lot of outraged citizens. What happens is that the IRS procedures um, call for them to be able to do an audit. They have to have a tax return to examine, to audit. So what happens if somebody does not file a return? When IRS recognizes that a person hasn't filed the Form 1040, um, they, in order to um, follow their procedures correctly, correctly uh, they, they make this thing called a substitute for return, a dummy return. It has no income or tax information, tax liability information on it. It has entity information only, your name, your social security, your address. The agent also has separately from the tax return a folder, a file, some working papers, and he gathers in that other information that does have indications of money that you've earned by virtue of paper trail items, W-2s, 1099s, uh, bank interest forms, different things that he has to have an awareness that you made some money. And so they make the presumption that therefore you have uh, a tax liability. They're not dealing with you as a, as a private citizen. You are an individual, an individual with respect to the national government. You've done something. And that is you've gone to work using a... Social Security number, somebody asked you for your Social Security number, you gave it. They have a federal uh, identification number. They think they're a federal employer. They report your income as gross income. Gross income is what they tax. You are now a taxpayer. And taxpayer has never won on that case. If it looks like a duck and it cracks like a duck and if it's uh, uh, got feathers and all that stuff, then it's a taxpayer. I had been doing the job for 10 years, basically was uh, minding my own business, relatively happy doing the job, and an acquaintance approached me and was making some claims, uh, a lot of claims, but basically the claims were that uh, people didn't have to file their 1040 tax returns, people didn't have to pay the income tax, uh, claims that the Federal Reserve was uh, uh, behind the uh, collection agency, IRS, and I disputed those claims. We had kind of an interesting conversation. 
at one point in time, he just looked at me and said, look, um, you have access to the law, don't you? He said, what, have you ever looked at the law closely and examined these things for your own self? And I said, well, no, I haven't. The IRS trains revenue officers to know procedures in how to uh, go about their job. So he said, do me a favor. He said, how about if you go research these things and tell me whether or not I'm wrong? And uh, I thought about that. I thought that was an unusual request, but I decided, okay, I can do that because I know I'm right and I know he's wrong, and I'll, I'll take some time and go find the laws and the, the things that will show that, uh, that I'm right. And lo and behold, several weeks into it, I started um, having some, some difficulties. Uh, more of the information that I was coming across from studying the inter Internal Revenue Code, the regulations, uh, case law, uh, the Constitution, uh, talking to other people in the movement who had, the tax movement who had spent many years in some cases uh, gathering information. And so there, there it was in front of me in the form of books and, and other information that would save me time as I was learning. Uh, I began to find out that the people that were saying that there is no law that compels most people to file an income tax return were true. was true. I found uh, uh, at some point in time there that I was wrong, that I didn't have the authority that I needed as a revenue officer to go out and summon people's uh, records from the bank, uh, levy their wages at their employer, that I didn't have the authority to seize their, their property by virtue of, of the fact of just giving them a, a notice of seizure. I was uh, really uh, disturbed about it because here I was doing that job and thinking that I was part of the solution, not part of the problem, thinking that I was doing something good. Somebody has to collect the taxes. Why not me? So uh, I, I finally just put in a resignation with uh, IRS and, and, and left because it was a matter of conscience at that point. One day I heard the media talking about this concept of Tax Freedom Day. And that got me wondering, well, if there's freedom, then there must also be some form of slavery before Tax Freedom Day. They were saying the Tax Freedom Day during that given year was four and a half months into the year. So I started looking into the, the tax laws as a way to understand what that meant. Uh, to me, I've always thought that we lived in a free country and that uh, income taxes were un-American because they deprived people of property. And, of course, the most important kind of property a person has is their own labor uh, and the wages that result from that labor. And that's something we're born with. It's not something the government gives us. It's not a privilege. It's, it's a right. It's something we have. So I looked into some Supreme Court cases to find out what freedom really meant in terms of property rights in slavery. And I found the case of Yick Wo versus Hopkins back in 1885 where the Supreme Court ruled for the very idea that one man may be compelled to hold his life for the means of living for any material right essential to the enjoyment of life at the mere will of another seems to be intolerable in any country where freedom prevails as being the essence of slavery itself. And so that got me thinking, gosh, well maybe I need to look into this a little bit more. And I was so amazed and upset about what I found out that I decided to write a book so that I could share what I knew and learned with everyone. The more research I did, the more corruption and scandal I found. I found that the income tax subject is a bottomless pit of scandal and corruption, and there is no end of material. I'm here with an independent businessman named Nick Jessen, who thinks that the IRS is doing something illegal, especially when it comes to sending out a notice of levy. Nick, explain your point to me. What do you think the IRS is doing this wrong? Well, they sent out a notice of levy on one of my employees uh, last year, and I called them up and asked them if I had to comply. And, of course, they said I did have to comply. But when I mentioned to them there was a paragraph I missing, they hung up on me. And at that time, I threw the notice of levy in the trash and had not heard a word from them. Now, that paragraph that's missing was on, the, on this letter. It started with paragraph B instead of A, right? That's correct. And when, then you started to investigate. Yes. And when you found out what paragraph A said, what, what did you learn? 
Well, I was surprised at first that paragraph A indicated the only person that could uh, levy anyone was the Secretary of Treasury. The only person that could be levied is a government employee. IRS on occasion has answered that question and they've said that they removed it because it was confusing to taxpayers. Um, well, it's obvious why uh, it would be seen as confusing because the paragraph A is in the Internal Revenue Code under 6331. Uh, it says clearly who the notice of levy may be served to, uh, served on. And it's, it's referring there, for the most part, to government employees, government officials. So, yes, if you're a private employer and you look at the notice of levy that's come to you from the IRS on one of your employees, and you turn over and look at the code sections that are, that are there uh, to tell you ostensibly what is their authority for doing this, and you don't see paragraph A, well, as an employer, you don't think about it. But if you were to go look at the the code and see what paragraph A says, of course the IRS wants that confusion uh, taken away because it, it tells them that the government employee is the one that can be served a, a notice of levy. So you think then that the IRS is committing a fraud by sending out a notice of this kind to banks and others? Yes, I do. You did not heed their advice? You did not deduct the wages from your employee? No, I did not. And what happened? Nothing. And how long has it been now? A year ago today. Absolutely nothing. Are you afraid now? You've opened a kettle of worms for the IRS? No. Not as long as I stay within legal bounds of law. You know, I don't feel that there's anything to fear. And why are you willing to talk about this? Or do you want to talk about this? I think the Americans should be aware of what the government's doing. Which is something, in your opinion, that is legal. Yes. Well... It's a very interesting point indeed, and according to Nick Jesson, the next time you or your bank receives a notice of levy from the IRS, that is not the time to panic. That's the time to start asking some very serious questions. Did he do the right thing? Was that the correct thing to do, uh, is demand to know more about the, the notice that he got from the IRS? Of course he did the right thing. If everybody did what that uh, employer did, we wouldn't have the mess that we have. Citizens are required to make sure that the government is operating. And the way you do that is by questioning all authority. The authority that actually exists will be happy that you did that. Because there are all kinds of frauds committed on the public. They hang up on me. Because people believe uh, what they shouldn't believe. And if, if that continues, then we really can't have freedom. Because freedom only exists for those people who are strong enough to exercise it. And if you don't have the, the gumption to contest the authority of anybody who presents themselves as being part of the government, then uh, we're all going to lose our freedom. The employers in this country hopefully will start learning just how important they are in the process of stopping IRS from illegally taking people's paycheck by the notice of levy. You see, the only way that that can happen is if the employer agrees when they receive the notice of levy to send the funds from the person's paycheck to the IRS. Uh, I think it's quite clear that uh, judicially speaking, uh, in terms of due process in this land, they need a court order to do that. So the way that it happens is employers are afraid. They get threatened with a penalty for not turning over those funds to the IRS in response to a notice of levy. So they, they do it. If employers would take the time to learn that the withholding agreement between the employee and the employer is a voluntary thing and understand that they are not going to be held liable and get in trouble if they don't uh, force their employees to, with, to be withheld, then this thing can start getting turned around and people can start um, having fear go away and dissipate knowing the law. It's got to start with them knowing the law. A notice is a reminder. It's not a demand. And all they are saying in the notice of federal taxing is we tried very hard to get money from this taxpayer and he refused to send us any money. Of course, he refused because he didn't owe any money. 
But all they are saying is what they, they really attempted to do. They really attempted to, to get money. And they just said, pay us what you owe. And then there are these series of notices that go out, and each one getting larger and larger in amount because they say, well, you didn't pay us last time, and now there's penalties, and now there's interest. Uh, and so now this, what we started out with a small amount, now is a great big an- amount because you didn't respond to our letters or you, you didn't say the right things. And now you have this horrible amount to pay. You, you owe us a million dollars. Some people who are, are uh, enabled by the, the power to, to go out and, uh, and use means to compel people to pay uh, might have that go to their head. Go to their head indeed. The next speaker is a U.S. postal worker, and he was the target of a legal prank and the abuse of arrogant bullies who, in their ignorance, flex the muscles of the power entrusted to them and plunder into the lives of law-abiding innocents. Here is Mr. Whitey Harrell speaking about his trial. During the course of the trial, the state was using the U. S. Master's Tax Guide as the law to show the liability supposedly on the federal level, which in turn causes the necessity, the claim necessity of filing an Illinois return. The question came up about whether U.S. A master tax guide is a is the law for the Congress authorized this. Does Congress put this out? And the answer is no. People believe that the code is a law that requires them to pay a tax, and that's all they know. But of course, what they know is not so. The question was. Does U.S. mean federal? And the answer was no. The clip you just saw comes from the same eight-hour-long conference held at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. You can order a copy of the entire program at the number on, on your screen. And since media and the press overlooked the importance of this next testimony, I would like to introduce to you one of the jurors. At that trial. Be here. I, uh, first of all, I want to say and clarify that I am not the juror, okay? There were 12 of us, <laughs> um, and 12 fine citizens who were very concerned about doing what was right. When we first entered the courtroom, it seemed very easy. You know, well, okay, did he file or didn't he file? That's not too difficult to decide, you know? But it didn't take us long to realize that it wasn't going to be so simple. And I said, I think I just need to be clarified. What is Mr. Harrell being tried for? <laughs> and he read again, you know, the charge of willfully not filing income tax in Illinois. I said, okay, thank you. The defense kept talking about, you know, where is this law? And, and the judge finally looked at us and he said, I will instruct the jury according to the law. <laughs> and we went, oh, okay, he's going to give it to us, you know, maybe in a nice little format, whatever. So, needless to say, as soon as we got into deliberation, what did we look for? The law. And we're going through papers and going through papers, and we're going, okay, so where is the law? And finally, there was this one piece of paper, and it said... If you are filing jointly and if you are married and filing jointly and under the age of 65, you are required to pay Illinois taxes if you make this much money. And somebody said, there it is, there's the law. And I said, I think that was the tax code, wasn't it? Isn't that what they said was the tax code? Well, isn't that the law? And I said, no, didn't they talk about that? Well, yeah, we all came to agreement. No, that, that wasn't the law, that was the tax code. But they said, but if the judge said it, it must be the law. And we had one dear gentleman that was from Romania, Romania, and he, uh, he's an American citizen now, but he said, you know, in my old country, we couldn't challenge the law. But in this country, we can. <laughs> so that's when we wrote our first request. 
we wrote out, I wrote out the request and I said, would you please give us the number of the law that has this wording? And then I took the wording right off of the paper that he had given us. We waited a few minutes, you know, and uh, by the way, the bailiff was fairly new and he was like going bonkers. He's going, you want to give a request to the judge? Uh, well, I don't know. I've never seen that before. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, in a little bit, we got back our answer. And we looked at it, and it said, you have been given everything you need. Okay. Well, needless to say, we weren't pleased. <laughs> We're going, if it's that easy, why didn't he just write it down? And... This is when things got heavy because we're starting to look at each other and people are going, you mean we don't have to pay taxes? <laughs> and so then we got into, well, is it a moral issue? And, you know, I mean, government has to have money to do what it's doing and blah, blah, blah. And I know you'll have answers for that, but realize we were talking as dummies, okay? Uh, and so, you know, we're going, boy, this could get out, you know? <laughs> Pretty serious case. All of a sudden, this little case that we had all just shown up for to do our civic duty had become an awesome case with tremendous possibilities, you know? And so that's when the heated element kind of came in because people started getting emotional about taxes. And finally, I said, now, wait a minute. This is not a moral judgment that we're making. We're judging Mr. Harrell on the law. Let's get back to what we're talking about. We're judging him according to the law. Have you seen the law yet? No. And so we sent a second request. You know, please give us the papers that were submitted as exhibit number whatever for the defense. And we waited. And we got a note back and it said, you have requested, blah, blah, blah. You're being denied. <laughs> At that point, the other three jurors swung. They said, something is really wrong here. <laughs> And so some of them said, well, I just don't know. I mean, he's going to be getting away with it. And I said, wait a minute. If it's not the law, he's not getting away with anything but standing for his rights. And they said, well, you're right, you know. But, you know, we're so deeply ingrained in this, you know. And please be patient when you talk with other people. This is something that we've been taught all of our lives is a citizen is you know it's part of our being and so we had to crash through that and go but what are we really talking about we're talking about the law and i read the instruction from the judge which i don't have his exact wording but basically it was if he's not guilty then he's not guilty and that's when we all voted and we signed the papers. <laughs> Finally, I will never forget, <laughs> for one thing, the white face of the judge. <laughs> but the other that I will never forget are the mixed feelings of humility and pride. As the clerk read, as the clerk read, we the jury find the defendant, Galen Harrell, not guilty. If you are going to charge someone with failing to file a tax return, you have to establish that they are required to file. And that's what could be done uh, in Mr. Harrell's case. And that's why the jury found him not guilty. It ended up being a federal case because we got the indication that uh, the first stipulation for paying Illinois taxes is paying federal taxes. 
And so we said, no, wait a minute, if you don't have to pay federal taxes, then obviously you don't have to pay Illinois taxes. So I guess in a way it did end up being a federal case. Right. How come people end up in jail? How do they get put into prison? The government wants to collect as much revenue as possible. And so they employ people to do that. They employ people that call themselves the Internal Revenue Service. They also employ attorneys. And they can instruct the attorneys use the law to collect more revenue. But lawyers who are instructed to do this will do as lawyers do, and that's use the courts. And so they will go into court, and they will get their paperwork in order. They will take it to a grand jury, and they will tell the grand jury, this guy is not paying taxes. And you are. What are you going to do about that? What are they going to say? We are going to go after him. We are going to charge him with a crime. We are going to incite him. Now we know that the law that they claim that he has broken is the law that requires the tax collector to pay the taxes into the treasury. But they don't tell the grand jury that. So the grand jury thinks, as most people do, we have to pay taxes. Well, as a, in the general sense, we do have to pay taxes, and, and really, we all pay taxes. But this is the wrong way to make a person pay a tax, because it's a tax he doesn't owe. And it's a punishment for a tax, for not paying a tax he doesn't owe. And that's wrong. But that's how it's done. Your friends and neighbors do the legal lynching and that's what it is. And it just goes now to what is called a, the pettit jury, the small jury, the 12-member jury. And they find that person guilty if they believe the government. But you don't have to believe the government. Okay? Because if you start asking those questions that this employer asks, that this, this Mr. Harold's jurors ask, then you'll acquit you'll say, there is no law, there is no violation, there is no requirement to file, there is no tax to pay. According to commercial law, the lack of proper and timely protest equals consent, and failure to object to a defect at law means that you've acquiesced to it. That means that the government says there's a, a law against being green, and the government says, well, red is green, and you're red, and you don't immediately rebut it and say, no, red is red, red is different. The presumption is that the government is correct. And it's an unfortunate uh, state in America where uh, truth seems to be completely irrelevant. So the uh, educated uh, American would certainly challenge jurisdiction in free trial before anything ever got into the improper court. And the citizens that, uh, that do succeed against the government use the proper arguments and re rebut the government's presumption that because they filled out a 1040 form, they must be a taxpayer. So uh, it's just a, a matter of learning what your rights are. The government uh, picks on the, uh, the people that are ignorant of the law. It seems as if the buzzwords are presumption and law. Presumption is something assumed to be so until rebutted or denied. Now, <clears throat> if and when denied, it could become a matter of law since the burden of proof falls on the party that originated the presumption. Here's an easy example. I presume to have the authority to end the first part of this documentary. For the sake of argument, let's say you rebut or deny that. Now, the burden of proof falls on me to show authority. And here it is. See you in part two. If your tape is a copy of a copy of a copy, chances are you will trouble me for a better tape. Now, the tape is free, but for my time to package it, take it to the post office, lick the stamp, and pay for the shipping, you can mail me a $20 check, money order, or cash at the address on your screen. You may copy this tape only in its entirety so that the original message remains unaltered. Hello again. I'd like to call the material on this tape a starter kit and referral source that you can play over and over at your convenience. In order to better understand the particularities of the issues discussed here, one needs to have a look at the bigger picture. 
Here's a brief introduction to the Constitution, law, government, and jurisdiction. And please don't skip through this because it would be like you'd expect to collect fruits from a rootless tree. The United States Constitution is the organic document for our government. It's the, it's the document by which the people, we the people, came together and formed government. And so, as a people, we granted government certain powers, limited powers. So, we had the ability to limit what government could do, and that's what the Constitution is. It's a document of limitation. It says, here's what you can do, and anything else that's not in there, any powers we don't give you, you don't have. Now, routinely politicians and courts forget this. They, once you've had a lot of power and you start wielding it and people forget that, that, that this is a document of limitation, all kinds of problems happen. In America, we actually have many, many different types of jurisdictions. We have, in fact, 52 very distinct jurisdictions here in this country. Each state has its own laws and its own constitutions, and those laws and constitutions are born in relationship to the other. Now, after the Revolutionary War, the uh, states decided that it would be a great idea to share some powers that they had in common. For example, they thought it would be good to have a uniform postal service, a uniform military system, a uniform monetary system. So they created the 51st government, and that was the uh, federal government. And in Article 1, Section 8, for that government, they delegated some very specific powers. And those are outlined in the Constitution. And uh, according to the Tenth Amendment, the power is not delegated to the new federal government. We're going to be retained by the people. Now, the 52nd government that most people are not aware of is the government of the District of Columbia and the territories that are under what they call the exclusive jurisdiction of or under the sovereignty of the United States government. Now, those... Uh, that particular area gets its jurisdiction from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. And in those areas, uh, Congress creates exclusive legislation. When Congress is creating legislation for the state, it cannot exceed the constitutional limitations provided it in the Constitution. Now, here's why seeing the bigger picture is important. If you receive one of these IRS pamphlets, knowing what you know now, you would realize that the word income is missing in the title. And that makes a big difference. Like keeping that third of your money you've been uh, donating to some financial entities that are exempted from ever being audited. Furthermore, when you open up to the first page, paragraph one says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But since you saw the bigger picture, you know that uh, something was left out. But, that's a big but, all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. The other clause by which Congress can levy taxes is Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, and then again, in Section 9, uh, it touches on this again, so I'll read them in that order. So, uh, Clause 3 of Article 1 says, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included in this union. The founding fathers hated government abuse, especially abuse by taxation. So they created this incredible document, this incredible contract that would bind the government in the year 2001. And it very simply says that if they're going to impose a tax on any form of real or personal property, which would include our private earnings, it can only be done subject to the rules of apportionment. If we compare uh, Section 8, to Section 2, we see one is a indirect tax, duties, imposts, and excises, which are taxes essentially on commerce. Um, and we discussed those a little bit earlier. And then we have direct taxes, which are taxes directly on the people. And those are to be apportioned among the several states. Now, this word apportionment is, is pretty well understood by legal scholars, but frequently lay people don't really grasp its meaning. Apportionment is where the federal government makes levies attacks on the states according to population. And that leads us to Section 9, Clause 4, which I'll read. 
No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. An apportioned tax is a apportioned to the states according to population. So Congress takes a census, finds out that uh, California has 22 million people, and it's probably more than that now. I think that's a 1990 or 88 uh, number. But uh, And uh, Wyoming has 2 million people. So they would impose a tax on those states, a direct tax, levied on the people. Actually, the states are left free to collect it just about any way they can within the bounds of their constitution based on their population. So if Congress needs to raise uh, $10 million, and let's say we only had uh, two states, and California had 22 million, and Wyoming had had 2 million, uh, that's a t- total of 24. Well, uh, California would pay 22 24 of that total tax levy. And that's how apportionment works. Now, the Constitution also states that apportion taxes, these direct taxes, have to be enacted each year. In other words, an apportion tax levied by Congress has a life of exactly one session. So once that tax is levied and collected, in order for Congress to collect that tax again, they have to, to repass the bill. So direct taxes were always to be apportioned, and indirect taxes had to be uniform throughout the state. You may wonder what generates the confusion in the application of the income tax as a direct or indirect tax, and that is the different interpretations given to the 16th Amendment, which seems to imply that Congress has been granted new powers of taxing everyone's income without respect to the rules of apportionment. Although the Supreme Court has ruled that no new powers of taxing were granted, Misinterpretation and misapplication of tax laws have created havoc among the American people. The 16th Amendment, as correctly interpreted, is limited to indirect taxes, which carried over into the private sector would have to be apportioned. Otherwise, would be like people that work harder to make more money are being punished for their extra efforts through the graduated income tax. Graduated meaning the more money they make, the higher the tax rate. So if somebody works seven days a week to make that extra house payment, that person would be penalized by higher taxes. Where is the logic in that? And whose country do we live in? Even if there was a law that advocated that level of absurdity, we would grab the phone and call that scoundrel that even suggested it and fire his assets and send them to China. So, is the graduated income tax an apportion tax? No, the graduated income tax is not an apportion tax. Does the government have the constitutional authority to impose a non-apportion tax on our private earnings? No. Were the apportionment clauses repealed? No. According to the Supreme Court, the apportionment clauses are alive and well. The 16th Amendment gave the government no new taxing authority that it did not have prior to the 16th Amendment. And income in its constitutional sense is purely gains and profits from corporate activity. In a free country, the only way that people can be free is if the presumption that everyone knows the law operates. The only other presumption that it can be made is that there's a tyrant who knows the law and will tell you what it is and will tell you what to do. You are obligated to know the law. But if you are obligated to know the law, then so is the man who claims to represent the Department of the Treasury or the IRS. They are presumed also to know the law and and operate within the law. So if you ask that person for some proof of the government that they represent or the law that they are uh, enforcing, then they have to give that to you. Or you can safely assume that they have no authority. And they say, what do you mean you want to see our paperwork? We're IRS agents, and they showed me their badges. We're from Washington, D.C., and we've got to go take this business over here. And you, your chief says you're going to go help us. I said, and I will. I promise you I will if you'll show me my pa- your paperwork. And so they fished around and fished around and finally pulled out a crumpled up couple white sheets of paper and said, here's our, here's our seizure notices and everything. And I looked over and I said, hey, 
this is a little strange. I said, this is a little bit perplexing. I said, you're Harold, and you're Joan, Jones, and I said, your names are at the bottom of these seizure notices. And he says, yeah, our name's at the bottom of it. We're here to seize this property for the United States government. I said, let me show you something. <clears throat> let me show you something. <laughs> I said, read right there. Read right there. It's in the book. And he said, what's the book? I said, it's the U.S. Constitution. You would have thought that they just saw the cross. <laughs> Because <laughs> they shrunk back when I said it was the U.S. Constitution. Ah! Where did you get that? I said, out of my back pocket. <laughs> oh, is there power in this? And they said, well, I don't want we don't want to hear about the Constitution. I said, read that. And they read it. And it said that it would be signed by what? A magistrate, based on probable cause, signed by a magistrate. And I said, who signed these papers? And they said, we signed them. Which one of you are the magistrate? <laughs> no, there was not a magistrate among us. <laughs> I know in my heart of hearts that the people I left behind, the people that I work with, and I only work with a very small percentage of what makes up the IRS, that they're good people and that they were, they are just as uninformed on some of these issues as I was at that time. So you can't really hold that against them because they don't know what they don't know. And they believe what they believe based on the same things that we all believed before we started discovering the truth. I know that had I not have, had an open mind when I decided to take that person up on the challenge to refute what he said about the, the tax laws, if I'd have had a closed mind, I'm, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have persisted far enough to overcome those gut-wrenching, those disturbing things, things like, nah, my government wouldn't lie to me. They wouldn't have me going out and doing these things if I wasn't authorized to do these things. Uh, I think if I'd have had a closed mind in any shape or form, um, holding on to preconceived notions, I probably wouldn't have continued to the point where I did and to discover the truth. It took a, it took a lot of time and effort to go through that. In the process of supporting the many millions of people who have downloaded my book from my website, I've learned that there's one common thread among all those people, and that is they're fearful of the IRS procedures, of dealing with the IRS, of the laws. Uh, they don't know what's going on. And they would like to have something to grab onto, uh, some sense of structure uh, to govern the, the interaction they're, they're going to have with the government so they can be more assured of a positive outcome in their case. And so in my book, in Chapter 8, I've developed a, a chapter called Solutions, How to End the Tyranny. And I talk about a five-step process on how to extract yourself from slavery to the income tax. And once again, we need to remind ourselves that income taxes are voluntary. But there's still a burden of proof uh, that's imposed upon us uh, in backing out of that system because up to this point we've given the government an idea that we're liable because of what we've been doing. Uh, and we need to establish that we're no longer liable. This presumed liability is recorded in the IMF or the individual master file that is generated when someone applies for a social security number. The information entered in this file, however, is not written in plain English, it's written in code. So in order to understand what's in it, you would need an expert decoder. And here's what such an expert had to say in regards to the IMS. When they call you down with an order or anything else, uh, she was convicted to leave in a criminal investigation, you have no idea what the IRS is coming at you for. None. And they hide it. They hide it all here in code. And if you don't know these codes, you're in trouble. If your attorney doesn't know these codes, he's in trouble. Has no clue where to go. What happens is that this individual master file is filled with mistakes. And sometimes these are intentional. Because if you are not liable for a tax, uh, they have to create a liability. 
So if they uh, uh, see an opportunity, I imagine they'll succumb to it and they will uh, create obligations that you don't have. While the law may say one thing, the law may actually be very clear in certain parts. That does not necessarily mean that the courts are going to interpret it according to its plain meaning. One of the most interesting aspects, depressing at times, aspects of the study of income taxation in the United States, its history, its genesis, how we got to where we are today, is that the courts generally have a political agenda. And it's this political agenda that causes the problem. We call this judicial activism. Uh, earlier on this tape, I believe you saw a interview, a, a speech by a juror who was on a tax case in Illinois. And what I thought was very interesting about her testimony in front of that podium was that several times, at least two times, they requested copies of the law, additional, <coughs> excuse me, additional information from the judge which the judge refused to give them. Obviously, this judge was not uh, unbiased, but rather taking a position and trying to steer the jury toward a, a conviction of this man. Uh, anybody who studied law at all realizes that this is anathema to uh, the whole judicial process. Judges are supposed to be neutral and unbiased. They're supposed to apply the law and not their particular political agenda, personal agenda, social agenda, etc. However, this problem is not so much a problem with our system. Certainly there are checks we could put into the system that would curb some of the judicial abuse, but it's really a human problem that's as old as society. And that is essentially that people, whenever they're given a position of power, try to do what they feel is best. Sometimes the people are patently evil, and simply seek to use their, their power to abuse those beneath them. You can hide your income, you can put it in the mattress, you can put it in foreign banks, you can do all that. If you have no obligation to pay a tax, then not paying a tax does not make you a tax dodger or a cheat or a evasive uh, or someone who is trying to defeat that tax. State government regulates uh, occupations and professions so that the public will not be harmed by individuals who really are incompetent at those uh, businesses, those professions, those uh, activities. The purpose of a license is really to regulate, to identify these people and to make sure that they've had the training that's uh, necessary in order for the public to be protected. Teachers are licensed, they're, 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 they're given credentials. That does not cause them to be liable for an income tax. You can be required to pay a, a, a fee for the licensing as an accountant or as a surveyor, um, as a broker, a, a, sales, a real estate salesperson under a broker. If the license itself requires uh, a tracking, uh, record keeping of gross receipts or gross income or net income, then it's an income tax. There's a big push for uh, a national retail sales tax to replace the income tax. But I, I hope that we will have learned enough about taxation to know that that's not possible because the Congress doesn't have the power to legislate in that area. It can't create a national retail sales license. You know, all these systems that we have in place in America now, he somehow benefits because of them, and he's not paying his fair share for his part that he uh, benefits that he is receiving from that. So I think it's just assumed by people who serve on the juries that the, the man that would make money like he made would be guilty of some crime. If the basis of taxation... Uh, was uh, paying your fair share, okay. then I think probably we would want to exempt the families of people who have lost loved ones in war from ever having to pay any other tax. Wow. But that's not the way taxation works. It's impossible to determine taxation based upon 
a person's fair share. Because who is going to determine that? We have to determine taxation pursuant to law. We've got to go back to taxation. Direct taxes imposed on people and property equally and uniformly. Or if it's going to be imposed pursuant to the government's power to make law, then it's got to be strictly adhered to. There is no fair share because somebody will always step forward and say, I'm a better judge of what's fair. I'm a better judge of what's right. Uh, and you're better off with me making decisions for you. But we never had that type of government. And that's what you're asking for when you want to make a determination of taxation based on a fair share. It's just impossible. And so if it's impossible, let's not even go there. What comes across to me is that there's, there's this real genuine fear out there that if there was no income tax, that we wouldn't be able to have what we have in our society. Would everything just suddenly cave in if we didn't have the income tax or everybody just stopped withholding or whatever? Well, that's an assumption. That assumption that income taxes actually go uh, toward paying for something that you absolutely need. And that's not even proved. In fact, just the opposite, uh, I think, is, uh, is evident, that income taxes are not used for anything that people would miss if the income tax was not taken. I guess they can refer to the grace reports that President Reagan has. Well, you can find it there. You can find it in other places. You can just you can uh, make your own investigation mm -hmm. and determine what, uh, what power does the federal government have to produce things that you have absolutely need. The roads are paid for mostly by um, uh, fuel taxes and mm -hmm. tires. Um, taxes on uh, on uh, vehicles. There's nothing is going to happen um, if there is uh, a awakening of the populace to the fact that they don't owe an income tax. On the surface, it seems like a legitimate question. It really only points to the ignorance of our of our citizenry. Uh, we had no income taxes prior to 1916. As, as a legal matter. And actually, uh, there were no income taxes levied on the American people prior to 1936 with the advent of the Social Security Act. So, if that's the case, how did government function before these so-called income taxes were imposed? The truth of the matter is, if you go back and look at Treasury records, you'll find that the Treasury, the United States Treasury, was running a surplus in just about every year of its operation except during wartime at which point in time it used its apportionment powers, the Congress used apportionment powers, to levy more taxes from the state to bring the budget back into balance. So income taxes were never really uh, needed to raise money. In fact, the Secretary of Treasury in 1910, when the 16th Amendment was first proposed in the House floor, uh, stated on the record that the, that the uh, Treasury was running a, quote, embarrassing surplus. So... The idea that government needs the income tax in order to function is ludicrous. In actuality, the taxes that run the government are duties, imposed and excises, which are collected when imports are brought into the country, when cigarettes are sold. Uh, in 1996, uh, Americans paid over $200 million per day in gasoline taxes, federal gasoline taxes alone. So, and that doesn't count uh, state gasoline taxes, it doesn't count taxes on diesel fuel or other forms of fuel. I believe there's been a really a long program to uh, to make us less aware of how our government functions. Most people today think we have a democracy, which is patently false. Uh, all the founding fathers abhorred democracy. Uh, the perfect example of a democracy in action is a lynch mob. If, uh, if people think that that's a good form of government, well, uh, I hope that they will move to a country where <laughs> that's the way government operates because there's plenty of them out there. But in actuality, we have a republic. There's a huge distinction. In a democracy, the majority rules. So if the majority votes that your wife or your daughter is public property, she's public property. In a, in a uh, republic, on the other hand, we have a, uh, a system of laws that prote protect individual rights. The idea being, as the founder said, if, if 
the legitimate function uh, or if, if a legitimate government derives its just powers from the consent of those governed, then those governed, the people who come together and form government, are the sovereigns. They own the government. So <clears throat> how do we protect the rights of the people as a whole? Well, we can't do that unless we can protect the rights of the individual. If one person doesn't have a right, nobody has the right. And so every time a law is passed, you could say that a right is being taken away from the individual. And we say that, that, that it's for the public good, but is it really? And so I think we need to start looking at law and government much differently. First thing we should all resolve to do is do only those things that are lawful. Obey all laws and require the government to do the same. What I recommend to people is that you educate yourself about these issues Learn as much as you possibly can. Try to sift the wheat from the chaff. There's a lot of very well-meaning people out there who aren't attorneys. They haven't been through the, the rigorous training that we go through, and it is rigorous. Um, and so they make certain assumptions that aren't necessarily true, but they're, 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 their intention is good. But still, they come up with some great stuff. I'm an enrolled agent. Uh, enrolled agents uh, are certified by the uh, Internal Revenue Service to practice uh, before the IRS to represent taxpayers uh, in any capacity concerning taxes that they might have a problem. So I'm certified to be able to uh, intercede on behalf of people uh, to try to uh, explain to them the situation, help them read in between the lines. A lot of people come and they've got a multitude of different problems with IRS, uh, usually collection problems, sometimes audit problems. And so what I have to do is use knowledge that I have from, from having worked for the government for, for 10 years to try to minimize the damage uh, to the smallest extent possible. Sometimes uh, there's very little you can do. Other times there's quite a bit you can do to, to help a person get out of their jam. Gather information from every source and then start trying to make sense out of it. And when it doesn't make sense, uh, you know, hit the law books and so forth. And in educating yourself, carry that education to the polls, and when you find really good information, pass it along to your friends and neighbors. Don't be afraid, afraid to talk about it. I live in an area that um, is, I guess you'd have to call it upper middle class. When I moved to my neighborhood, I, I, I felt my neighbors were probably not interested in this, that they were too busy, uh, you know, uh, chasing the almighty buck, uh, you know, trying to get a, you know, an SUV so they could show off to their neighbors and and keeping up with the Joneses to be concerned about tax law. And I have to say that it was a misconception. Uh, what happened is uh, because I am so involved and because these issues are so important to me, I found myself in talking with them, not being able to stay away from the subject. Somehow I would just make some flippant comment, some offhand comment about, uh, you know, how about those taxes or whatever it is. And uh, we would end up in a conversation. And, and as I came to discuss these things with people, I realized that, that everybody's concerned. I, you know, uh, I just can't tell you how many people that you would think uh, would just brush you off as a nutcase are very, very concerned about these issues, and they're confused. And to the extent that you can educate them and raise their awareness and get them thinking, challenge their thought process when you've been taught something from birth that is so. For example, the world used to be flat. It was a fact. Everybody knew the world was flat. You could look out on the horizon and see, the world is flat. Would you find it hard to believe that some people might still hold that to be true? However, while it took some giant steps for mankind to prove the contrary, smaller steps will be sufficient for dealing with the issues at hand. Step one, good citizenship, that includes becoming a responsible juror, uh, voting consistently for representatives who are aware of these issues and who will advocate the proper legal moral position and also sending letters to your congressmen and elected officials when they get out of line. Step two is preparation and that includes getting informed and being prepared and that, that doesn't necessarily mean you should watch the mainstream media because they aren't always going to tell you the truth. They're going to put a spin on things which means you need to download my book, read it, uh, investigate the uh, sources that I identify in chapter um, 12 under litigation resources. I have websites, books and publications, legal resources that you can all reference. Attorneys, if you find other resources that are available, please let me know. I'll add them to the book. 
Step three, making yourself judgment proof is, proof is really about making sure that your assets are uh, not subjected to risk of loss from the IRS because of the way that you manage them or document them or maintain them. The fourth step is the administrative battle. And that's when we actually start confronting the IRS, getting in their face and making sure that they understand what we want, the legal foundation of why we believe what we believe, and creating a paper trail that documents the, the foundations of our belief and our good faith efforts to make sure that they know, uh, that we know what the law says. The fifth step is the legal battle. If you've exhausted all avenues for administrative redress and you've done everything that you're supposed to do by IRS procedure and by procedure in my book and you still can't get what you want and the IRS is holding on to your money and not giving it back to you because you asked for a refund, then you've got to drag them in court and you have to know the law. Now, with all those steps in mind, uh, people want to know, well, gosh, how do I find the right attorney? How do I know if I've got a good attorney? And I've got... Uh, a test for tax professionals in section 14.1 of, of my book under, uh, in section 14 is, is forms which tells you the kind of questions you need to ask a prospective attorney and if he has good answers to these questions and if he doesn't get overly emotional and if he, if, if he isn't biased on the issues he'll have an open mind he'll answer the questions and you can review those questions and then you can go back to chapter 3 of my book which talks about the legal foundations of the income tax in Chapter 5, which talks about the evidence. Now, remember the rules of evidence. And an attorney can tell you about this a lot better than I can. But if you document your steps, and you document them properly, all of a sudden there becomes a confrontation at some point in time. Document to the employer. In other words, send him the appropriate documentation, the letter or whatever, explaining the law to him. He will turn it over to his legal team, possibly, and they will say that it doesn't matter. The law says we've got to withhold the money. Fine. Let them withhold the money. You have done your part of that step. When you get your first check and you've got the money withheld after you sent this letter, send a copy of the letter with a reminder letter that says, I told you that you shouldn't do this, and you're still doing it. Okay? Again, non-confrontational, just simply documenting the issue. Eventually, the end of the year will happen. They will continue withholding because you'll get ignored at that point in time by most employers. Then, when you get to W-2, go through what I refer to as the 4852 process of refuting the W-2 to the employer in writing, asking them to correct the errors of his way and return your money. Chances are he won't do it. At that point in time, now you go through the 4852 with the government. In other words, you're now, and I recommend filing the income tax in a very special way. But what you're going to do with that 4852 process is in effect refute the testimony because remember the W-2 is testimony from the employer to the IRS under penalty of perjury that these are true and correct. IRS takes them and they rely upon that testimony and that's the only testimony against you on a W-2 case. 1099 is the same situation. It's the only testimony against you. The IRS, when they come to a court situation, they will be in uh, bring in their experts to say that yes, we received the W-2. They won't bring in the employer in, but you can if it ever gets to that point in time. Because it's an adversary situation if you're at that level. Now, when you're claiming that money back, if it's done properly, you've now set up to go into court to get that money back. When we're selecting an attorney, we need to make sure that they're willing to work with us as more of a more as a coach than a full service provider because litigation may be extended and we want to provide as much of the, of the activity or, uh, or uh, effort as we can to minimize the expense because the more we can do that, the more staying power we're going to have to litigate the case. And the way we can create a coaching environment rather than a full service environment is by negotiating agreement with the attorney up front called an association of counsel which identifies the division of labor or effort between you and your attorney. And I've got a sample version of that in my uh, book in Chapter 14, which you're welcome to look. Chris Hansen's book is free for downloading on the Internet. But if you'd rather have a book, you can purchase it uh, from We the People Foundation as the number on the screen.
I have been researching this now since uh, the 80s, and of all of the arguments that I, that I have seen, and all of the things that work and all of the things that don't work, it comes down to just the two basic principles. Number one, jurisdiction. You really have to make a record that you are a private citizen and that you're not subject to the jurisdiction of this particular court. Jurisdiction uh, is not something that's automatically conferred on the court. You, if you don't challenge it, the judge is going to assume that you're going to uh, uh, agree that the, the court and he has jurisdiction over you. Some of the things that people do is to, to establish a paper trail that shows their good intent, not their bad faith, but their good faith, that they've read the law, they've got opinion letters, letters from experts who have ruled on certain questions for them, and so they're, they're demonstrating for the future purposes that they've made a good faith decision and conclusion that they're not a person that's liable. Every correspondence you get from the IRS, you want to make sure that you respond back to it promptly, that you refute the claims that they're making if they're trying to establish that you're, you've got a legal liability, and you want to make sure that they are, are um, that, that in every one of your correspondences you're talking about the legal foundations of, your, of the laws. You want to stay away from the IRS publications. Those are anathema to getting out of the tax system because they quite frankly are a fraud. And the courts have ruled that the IRS is not responsible for what's in those publications, nor are they responsible for the advice they give you on their 800 number. So you have to know, you have a responsibility to know what the law says. When somebody's been taught that something is a fact all their life, and you come to them with some new information that appears to be true, is credible, has foundation, they go through what's called cognitive dissonance, where their mind rejects that information because... It means that they've been doing the wrong thing all their life, and it, 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 it challenges them to the core. They, they actually become afraid. Fear mostly is caused by a lack of knowledge. You can't move forward and make a decision uh, when you feel like you don't understand something or you don't have complete information. So that's partly uh, what I hope to contribute, is to help people understand the facts, understand the truth, know how they've been duped because even if they haven't yet, when they discover that they've been duped, even if they haven't taken any action to disobey th these quote-unquote civil tax laws that we've been following for 87 years, if, if enough people finally realize the truth and are talking about it, and demanding uh, that the government answer for this injustice in the way that the laws have been administered, then something can happen and will happen. One thing that every person involved in the freedom of movement agrees on is that there is no statute in the entire Internal Revenue Code that imposes a mandatory tax on an occupation of common right in any of the American states. Why? Surely and absolutely because it was not within the authority of Congress to create such a law. Since we're approaching the end of this documentary, I'd like to suggest to everyone a little soul-searching. Ask yourselves if things are really the way they ought to be. Does it seem like some uneasy feeling is creeping in and you don't know why? Does it seem like it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet? Do you find yourself ever complaining about the way things are? I realize these are very general questions, but whatever specific questions or complaints you may have, remember that unless you do something about it, chances are the trends will continue and worsen. And also, unless you do something about it, what right would you have to complain or even expect any change? If we were to look back to the founding of our nation and, and we were able to talk to someone like Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or any of the prominent people that were involved in government back then, would they be willing, in your mind, to fill out an income tax? They wanted to create a government that would allow people to be free. Taking responsibility for themselves allowed them to be free. All they wanted of government was the opportunity to do that. They knew it was uh, going to be totally different from what had existed before because now it was going to be the people who were really in charge of their freedom. And when you, when you start to lose that is when you uh, start relying on somebody else to provide that freedom to you. 
if you go to a, if you go to a judge thinking that that judge is going to give you freedom, then you've you've lost it already. If you go to the government thinking that they're going to protect your freedom, then then it's it's really going to be hard to regain. I very much see the possibility that we as a nation uh, can uh, cause that change, but we'll have to get a check on our fear. We'll have to come to grips with that. Uh, some of us already have, but we need a lot more people that will have to address that. Your neighbor is fighting for his freedom and may not be expert at it as I am or my clients are. But with a little bit of assistance from his friends and neighbors, he could, he could stay out of trouble because he's not getting into trouble because he's breaking the law. He's getting into trouble because you are turning your back on him. And you're turning your back on the history of this country. You're turning your back on the history of taxation. You're turning your back on freedom. You're turning your back on everything that this country was founded on because you think it's going to be more comfortable to listen to what somebody tells you is the law rather than you figure it out for yourself.